Until now, uh, we discussed the experimental side of quantum mechanics. We looked at the double slit experiment. We looked also at the stern garlock experiment, and we have now an idea as to how the quantum mechanical world behaves. Okay. Now it is time to go into the mathematical formula uh, formulation of quantum mechanics. Now, so in the following sections, okay, in, in this class and the following classes, we'll be formulating the basic mathematics of vector spaces as used in quantum mechanics. Now we got what we had in uh, the previous classes is that we got some motivation to choose vector spaces as the correct mathematical framework for quantum mechanics. From the double slit experiment, we saw that, let me write as DSC. From the double slit experiment, we saw that there was something called the principle of superposition. We had to posit this to explain the interference pattern that we saw on the screen, even when you send one electron at a time. So we, we saw that vectors naturally incorporate the principle of superposition. So vectors might be uh, the correct mathematical uh, framework for quantum mechanics. And from the stern garlock experiments, and by comparing it, with, comparing it with the polarization, the case of polarization, also there we saw that uh, the logic of vectors might apply to quantum mechanics. Okay? So this is the reason why we'll be discussing the basic mathematics of vector spaces, especially as used in quantum mechanics. Now, a word on the notation that we'll be using, it's called the Bra and Ket notation, and this was developed by Dirac. Okay? Now, the theory of linear vector spaces or complex vector spaces, it had been known to mathematicians even before the advent of quantum mechanics. But Dirac's way of formulating has many advantages, especially from uh, the physicist's point of view. Okay? That's the reason why we'll be explicitly following the Dirac uh, notation. Now we'll be considering a complex vector space whose dimensionality is specified according to the nature of a physical system under consideration. So we had said that the three-dimensional real vector space will not be sufficient to describe the quantum mechanical world. We need a different sort of uh, uh, dimensionality, right, or different sort of vector space. We said that it's a complex vector space. And what about the dimensionality of this complex vector space? You know, the dimensionality will be specified by the nature of the physical system under consideration. All right? So basically, if you are talking about the electron, okay, the dimensionality of the vector space okay, will depend on how many different things the electron can actually do, all right, or how many different types of measurement outcomes are possible. Right? So the number of possible measurement outcomes. Okay. So the dimensionality of the vector space will depend on the number of possible measurement outcomes. Okay. For example, if you are talking only about the spin, we know that if you are measuring the component of spin along any axis, there are only two possible results. Right? There are only two possible measurement outcomes. Okay. Now this will mean that for if you if you want to describe only spin, if you want to uh, say everything about spin, we'll need a two-dimensional complex vector space. All right. Now, we can consider observables with a continuous spectra, and in that case, the number of alternatives is non-denumerably infinite. Okay, for example, if you are looking at the position of a particle in space, okay, you can think of a free particle, and uh, if you are talking about the position of that particle, if you are measuring the position of that particle, we'll see that even between any two points in space, all right, there, there are an infinite number of points. There are an infinite number of points. So we say that the spectrum of possible measurement outcomes, if you are talking about the position, the spectrum of possible measurement outcomes is infinite. Right? The number of possible measurement outcomes is infinite. It could be anywhere in space. All right? And it's also non-denumerably infinite. So non-denumerably infinite means also it's also called as uncountably infinite. Uncountably infinite. Okay. So if you are talking about an infinite set, all right, a set with an infinite number of elements, it could be countably infinite or non-countably or uncountably infinite. In the case of countably infinite, all right, if you set, if you take the set of natural numbers, for example, set of natural numbers, this we say it is infinite. Of course, there, there are an infinite number of natural numbers, but this is countably infinite. This is countably infinite. Okay. 
But if you take the set of real numbers, if you take the set of real numbers, if you take the set of all real numbers, this is uncountably infinite. Uncountably infinite. Okay. Actually, even if you take uh, the, the, all the real numbers between any two uh, natural numbers or between any two real numbers even, all right? between any two numbers basically, if you take all the real numbers between any two numbers, again, there are an uncountably infinite number of real numbers between any two numbers. All right? So this is the difference. So when you say that uh, a set is non-denumerably infinite, you mean that it is an infinite set which cannot be put in one-to-one -one correspondence with the set of natural numbers, all right? Even though we are talking about infinite, uh, what do you say, set with an infinite number of members, there are different types of uh, infinite, all right? There are different ways in which you can talk about infinite. There could be a countably infinite number of elements, or there could be an uncountably infinite number of elements, okay? All right. Now, the example, as I said, is a position or momentum, even momentum, right? We say that it's a continuous spectra because corresponding to every possible uh, measurement outcome, or we can say that the measurement outcomes can be mapped onto real numbers, right? If you want to talk about uh, the position of an electron with, with uh, uh, precision, right? You will have to talk, you will have to use real numbers, right? Not uh, natural numbers, right? So that's also the case of momentum. So th in th these cases, we say that the spectrum is actually continuous. The spectrum of measurement outcomes is actually continuous. All right. Uh, so because, because the idea is that if you take any two numbers, all right, if you think of any real number, that could be a possible measurement outcome. All right. That's the basic idea. If you, you can think of any real number, especially if you are talking about the free electron, for example, you can think of any real number, and that could represent a particular point in space, and that could be a possible measurement outcome. So we say that it's a continuous spectrum. All right. So it's not discrete, it is continuous. Now, in this case, the vector space uh, is known as Hilbert space, and it will have an infinite number of dimensions. We said that the dimensionality is decided by the number of measurement, possible measurement outcomes. And if you are talking about a continuous spectrum, you will have an infinite dimensional vector space. And in this case, it's usually called the Hilbert space. Okay, It was developed by David Hilbert, who studied vector spaces in infinite dimensions. Now, uh, let's come to the state of a quantum mechanical system. How do we specify the state of a quantum mechanical system? Now, earlier from the uh, by taking motivation from the double slit experiment, we said that the state of a quantum mechanical system is represented by vectors in linear vector space, all right? Vectors in complex vector space. So basically, states will be represented by vectors, okay? So in quantum mechanics, a physical state, for example, a silver atom with a definite spin orientation, it is represented by a state vector in a complex vector space. So there is a mapping between state and the physical state and vectors in the complex vector space. All right. Now, following Dirac, in Dirac notation, the vector will be called a ket. Okay. The vector will be called a ket. So it is denoted by this angled bracket. Okay, you could put uh, anything inside this angled bracket that uh, tells us something about the state of the system. Okay. So the vectors will be denoted by some. A symbol inside an angled bracket and it is called ket and this we can call as ket alpha. All right. Now the idea is that the state ket contains complete information about the physical state. Okay. Everything we are allowed to ask, okay. everything we are allowed to ask about the state is contained in the ket. Now in, even in classical mechanics we know we have specified the state. All right. We know how to specify the state because if you are for example using Newton's equations as the the evolution equation for a set of particles. Okay, how do you specify the state of a classical mechanical system? For example, uh, a system of particles. In that case, you have to specify the position and momentum of all the particles. You give the position and momentum of all the particles, and then the state is completely specified. All right. The idea is that if you know the state of the system of the classical mechanical system, you should be able to answer any question that you can ask. Uh, related to the system, right? So you can ask anything about the system. If you know the state of the system, you should be able to answer that, okay? Now, for example, you, once you know the state of the classical mechanical system, you could ask what's, what would be the momentum of a particle after some time, what's the position or what's the energy, what's the angular momentum. 
any such questions uh, has to be answered if you know the state of the system right it should contain the complete information about the system but in classical mechanics there are certain questions that we can ask which are not allowed in quantum mechanics we'll see this all right so that's why I have, we have included a word here everything we are allowed to ask in classical mechanics we don't make this distinction all right we are allowed to ask anything about a classical mechanical system if it's a classical particle we can ask what's the position at a particular time what's the momentum at the same instant of time we are allowed to ask this and the information of the state knowledge of the state provides us answers to these questions okay but for a quantum mechanical system you are not allowed to ask certain questions you might already be familiar with the uncertainty principle from where you know that uh, you cannot specify the momentum and position of a quantum mechanical particle uh, at, a, at, at, uh, at the same time. All right? So this is basically the uncertainty principle. So in quantum mechanics, basically you are not allowed to ask what's the momentum and position of a particle at a particular time. This is a question that is not allowed. So in quantum mechanics, things get a little bit complicated and there are questions that we are allowed to ask and there are questions we are not allowed to ask. Okay. Anyway, if, you, if, you, if we find the questions that we are allowed to ask, in that case, the information of the state should give you the answer to all such questions. Okay. Now, two kets can be added. If you are looking at vectors, two vectors can be added to, get another, to give another vector in the same space. So, the, that's the same thing that we are translating here. Two kets can be added to get a new ket. All right. So, this is how we can incorporate the principle of superposition uh, into quantum mechanics. Okay. So the sum of two vectors is just another ket. Now we can multiply the ket by a complex number and it results in another ket. Right? So you can multiply the ket by a complex number and basically you get another vector, a different vector. All right. So this is similar to what we can do in the real vector space. If you have a unit vector, you can multiply it with a real number and get another vector you get another vector with the same direction. So you can also say that alpha and C alpha have the same direction. They have the same direction. Okay, in some sense, they have the same direction. Okay. Now the basic idea in quantum mechanics is that alpha and C alpha, they all represent the same state, same physical system or same physical state. Okay. So in quantum mechanics, the postulate is that alpha, C, alpha, etc. Right? Multiples of the vector also represents the same state. Okay? If, if alpha represents a particular physical state, then C alpha also represents the same physical state. Okay? Now, this is what we do in quantum mechanics. So basically, actually, we should say that uh, a quantum mechanical state is represented by a direction in the complex vector space. Okay? If, so I think it's bet sometimes we should say that, maybe it's better to say that, or it's more precise to say that, the quantum mechanical state, quantum state, is represented by a direction in a complex vector space. Okay, so all vectors with in this direction represent exactly the same physical state. Okay, it represent exactly the same physical system. I hope this is clear. Now the C could be zero, and then we say that the resultant ket is a null ket. Okay, this complex number that you multiply it with, in general, it could be a complex number. You could multiply it with zero, and if you multiply a ket with zero, what you get is a null ket. Okay, so we have also null kets in quantum mechanics. All right. Now, also, it doesn't matter on which side you put the number. Okay, you could put the number on the left of the ket or on the right of the ket. There's no problem. So we are building up the notations that we can and we cannot use. All right? So if it's a number, it doesn't matter where you put. You could put it on the left or on the right of the ket. All right. One of the physics postulates is that alpha and C alpha with C not equal to zero, okay, we should specify Z with C not equal to zero, they represent the same physical state. In other words, only the direction in vector space is of significance. Mathematicians may prefer to say that we are here dealing with rays rather than vectors. All right? So even though we say uh, the states are represented by vectors, we should actually say that states are represented by rays or a particular direction in the vector space. Okay? But we'll be using the term vector and assume that we understand. Okay? We understand that alpha and C alpha represent the same state. 
And what array in Hilbert space is actually a set of vectors where all, all vectors of the set are multiples of each other. Okay, so array in, in, in the language of vector spaces, it means it's a set of vectors all with the same direction, all right? All with the same direction. And all these vectors represent the same physical state. All these vectors in this set represent the same physical state, okay? So if you want to be really precise, you should say that the quantum mechanical uh, states are represented by rays in the Hilbert space, or rays in the complex vector space, okay? But hereafter, we'll be again using the term vector, and we assume that it is understood. So this means that we are allowed to multiply a vector. We are allowed to multiply a state vector, a vector that represents a state. We are allowed to multiply it with a complex number without changing the state. Okay? We'll be using this freedom a lot, and it, it is important. Okay? So, so you remember that if alpha represents a vector, C alpha also, sorry, if alpha represents a physical state of a quantum mechanical system, then C alpha also represents the same physical state. This means that you are allowed to multiply a state vector by a complex number without changing the state, without changing the physical state. Okay, so this has to be remembered. So we have seen that states of a quantum mechanical system can be represented by vectors in uh, complex vector space. Okay, what about observable quantities in quantum mechanics? Now this question may be a little bit strange in the outset, but in, because in classical mechanics, we have no distinction between specifying the state and the observable. Okay, observables are quantities that you can measure, the energy, momentum, position, angular momentum, all these are observables. In classical mechanics, there's no difference between specifying the state and giving you information about the observables. All right? in classical mechanics, if you know the state of the system, okay, you also know the answer to all the questions regarding any observable quantity. Okay, if you know the state of the system, you know what's the energy of the system, you know what's the angular momentum of the system, this gives you the information about what is the kinetic energy of the system. All these observables are known if you specify the state. Okay? In classical mechanics, the labels that specify the state also specify the observables. Right? So there is no distinction between state and observables in, quantum me in, in classical mechanics. But in quantum mechanics, specifying states and representing observables are two entirely different things. Okay? So this is how things get different from classical mechanics. And observables such as momentum and spin components can be represented by an operator. Okay, we call it an operator such as A in the vector space in question. So what are operators? Operators are objects that act on vectors. Right? Op operators are objects that act on vectors and give new vectors, other vectors. All right? so this is what you mean as operator. So you can think of operator as a machine with two slots. There's an input slot and an output slot. If you input a vector, you'll get another vector from the output. Right? So you can think of the operator as a machine that takes in a vector and gives you another vector. All right. Now, so in, let's fix the notation first. The, this, here, what I have meant is that the operator A acting on the ket alpha. Okay. So this will denote simply as A ket alpha. This is how we'll denote it, all right? Now, if you want this operator to be acting on ket alpha, we always put it on the left of the ket. Remember to put it always on the left of the ket. Okay, this you have to fix the notation. If it's a complex number, it doesn't matter where you put, but if it's an operator, we'll always put the operator on the left of the ket. So we can say that A alpha gives you another vector beta. Now, more on this multiplication operations associated with operators we'll be discussing later. And also, hereafter, we shall use the words operator and observable interchangeably. All right? Just so let me clear this language. We'll be using so many words with the same meaning. For example, we'll use state, we'll use a state vector, or simply get. Okay? All these words will be used with the same meaning. All right? When we say the word state, it means a vector in the complex vector space. Okay? We can say the state vector to, to suggest that it's a vector that represents the physical state. Or we can simply say the ket or the state ket even. All, right? All these words will be used interchangeably to represent the state of the physical system. Okay? For our purposes, all these are the same. In the same way, it will be convenient to use the word operator and observable interchangeably. Okay? So, for example, we'll, we, we could say that 
A is an operator that represents a particular observable, or we can say that A is an observable. It means the same thing for us. 